Okay, good morning. I hope I can uh, keep you people entertained enough to stay. Um, I'm going to talk today about the neuromodulation of gait for Parkinson's disease and spinal cord injury. First of all, I will uh, discuss what system we're dealing with, a very basic overall perspective of uh, locomotion generation. Then I will discuss uh, uh, the use of uh, deep brain stimulation as a neuromodulation strategy for improvement of freezing of gait in Parkinson's uh, disease. Then I would like to uh, discuss uh, issues that have uh, um, arisen during the, uh, um, the foray into this particular methodology and some of the controversies. Then I would like to go to um, uh, show you what the basic science uh, literature is showing about this system and our use of um, uh, the rat and the pig model for spinal cord injury to investigate uh, some of these controversies with respect to deep brain stimulation of parts of the, of the brain stem for uh, initiation of locomotion and its usefulness in spinal cord injury. And then I would um, close on uh, uh, some of the recent developments that we have with collaborations here with the Department of Neurological Surgery and Neurology for a clinical trial uh, in Parkinson's disease. Okay, so. Let's see. Next slide. All right. So <clears throat> walking is uh, produced by a central pattern generator, which is found in the spinal cord. It's found in virtually every single vertebrate species to date that have been studied. Uh, and there is also now evidence that it exists uh, in the human spinal cord. So the question is, how is it activated? This is an example of um, a, a early experiment from the 60s, which showed uh, one of the first demonstrations in a decerebrate cat preparation about the control of locomotion. This animal uh, uh, is actually responding to changes in the speed of the treadmill and will go in, uh, from a walk to a trot to a gallop, depending upon the speed of the treadmill. So <clears throat> the mesencephalic locomotor region is an area of the brain which is physiologically defined as an area which can initiate locomotion when stimulated. It's been shown uh, from um, the early 60s um, that uh, it can initiate, when electrically stimulated, a locomotor activity. Uh, it is found in virtually all species tested to date, and it corresponds to an area of the midbrain the cuneiform nucleus, uh, the subcuneiform region, and there is additional evidence that uh, uh, stimulation of the adjacent cholinergic uh, nuclei, the pedunculopontine nucleus, has also been a, a, a suggested as a component of this mesencephalic locomotor region. So <clears throat> the, M the MLR, as I will refer to it, does not project directly uh, to the spinal cord, but rather it terminates in the brain stem in the medial reticular formation. You can see here from autoradiographic studies that were done by Steves and Jordan in 84, an injection of an autoradiographic anterior grade tracer in the cat brain stem shows the expression of, of the terminals uh, of this particular tracer in the medial reticular formation above the trapezoid body, and you can see on the lateral or sag sagittal sections how it terminates into this area. So here in the medial reticular formation, it activates the reticulospinal neurons, and these are the neurons that project through the ventral funiculus of the spinal cord to terminate on interneurons within the spinal cord, which are part of the pattern generating component. This pathway, the reticulospinal pathway, is considered to be the command pathway. And 
we have shown that if you block synaptic or, or fiber transmission with cooling of the brain stem, you can actually uh, block the uh, locomotor activity that's initiated with brain stem stimulation. Here we can see uh, the locomotor activity that we record from hind limb uh, uh, electroneurograms and an intracellular recording from a uh, flexor digitorum longus motor neuron, pre-cool during MLR stimulation. And when we cool the medial reticular formation to block synaptic transmission there, then the locomotor activity virtually ceases, and with rewarm, it comes back. Likewise, cooling the uh, ventral funiculus, lateral ventral funiculus of the spinal cord will block a locomotor activity on the side of the cooling, and then it reappears with uh, uh, rewarming. So that demonstrates the uh, causal linkage between the reticulospinal pathway and the, the uh, interneurons within the spinal cord. More recent uh, um, demonstrations of, of activation of, the of reticular formation neurons has been shown with chemical and optogenetic stimulation, and that this will initiate locomotion uh, as well. Now, in <clears throat> so how can we, what, with this information, is it possible that one can actually modulate the locomotor activity? It's, this area, physiologically defined, will produce locomotion when stimulated. Now, one of the problems with Parkinson's disease is uh, that uh, um, gait dysfunction is manifested as a uh, freezing of gait uh, with a, and associated with postural instability. Likewise, in um, spinal cord injury, gait impairment uh, depends upon the level and severity of the injury and ranges from mild deficits to complete paralysis. If capable of walking, spinal cord injury patients will walk slower. They have increased rates of oxygen consumption and decreased strength and variable uh, levels of weight bearing. These patients also present with severe limitations in walking speed and decreased range of motion and a distortion of intralimb coordination. Now these Deficits are, um, can be um, measured by the uh, uh, Asia impairment scale, which is listed here, uh, which ranges from complete impairment, uh, Asia grade A, to uh, different levels of incom incomplete uh, impairment, uh, B, C, and uh, D. And <clears throat> for our purposes, if we were to possibly use deep brain stimulation for modulation of gait after spinal cord injury, we would be most interested in targeting populations that are within the C and D uh, Asia scale. So what is the, what is the problem? What's and the problem here is the pathology that um, results in locomotor deficits in Parkinson's disease is different from that in spinal cord injury. In Parkinson's disease, we of course have a dis or a miscommunication between the basal ganglia and uh, 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 the higher brain centers with the mesencephalic locomotor region. So that's where the deficit is occurring. <clears throat> In spinal cord injury, of course, we are now interrupting, at least in part, the signal which descends from the reticular formation to the spinal cord uh, pattern generators. So the pathology is somewhat different. Brian, what's the, what's the human evidence that the reticular spinal tract is important in people? Uh, okay. So with uh, there is some evidence that lesions within this region can actually uh, uh, result in impaired locomotor activity. As well, uh, there was the work um, by Blair Clancy uh, here at the Miami Project earlier in the 90s, which demonstrated that uh, certain parts of the uh, uh, brain stem was actually involved in modulation of, of gait, which would occur spontaneously in the patients that they were looking at uh, with spinal cord injury. So that this would be, be the key information 
that these systems are actually in, in play. And, and the other thing is that just by virtue of, of, of the work that's been done in a majority of animals to date, all have demonstrated that reticulospinal pathways are the key descending component of, uh, uh, for initiation of walking. So what are the approaches that we could possibly use, neuromodulation approaches, um, to use existing pathways um, to further or facilitate uh, the gait. Well, there are physical therapies, uh, uh, exercise training, vibration, pharmacological therapies, drugs, neurotransmitter applications, transplants, and then there are electrical stimulation uh, paradigms, uh, such as transcutaneous or transcranial magnetic stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation, spinal cord stimulation with epidural uh, electrodes, and deep brain stimulation. The targets for deep brain stimulation for modulation of movement um, are presented in this slide. And you can see there are quite a few different regions that are actually being tested and or uh, used in the clinical theater. Here is the uh, mesencephalic locomotor region and it's con um, it is indicated here by the pedunculal pontine nuclei. So this would be the target that would be of interest for freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease. So there is a human uh, homologue of the MLR, and it is found in the region of the uh, cuneiform and the PPN area at the level of the inferior colliculus. Looking at uh, images here obtained with blood oxygen level dependent uh, signals uh, during mental imagery of standing, walking, or running, increased activity can be observed uh, here in the midbrain. The uh, mesencephalic locomotor region location that's found in uh, uh, the animal literature is uh, overlaid here to sh show the relative um, coalescence of the data. With respect to the position on uh, stereotaxic uh, uh, atlases, uh, you can see here the cuneiform nucleus and the pedunculal pontine in the midbrain, and they are adjacent uh, to each other. Now, let's take a look and uh, see what um, if we can start this. Can we start the uh, video, please? Yeah. So it's really quite fascinating, the, uh, the effectiveness of this stimulation in, in persons with Parkinson's disease. Here is pre-op, a patient which is showing difficulty in, in the initiation of his walking. He has difficulty going forward as well as turning. post-operative of the implant and then with stimulation of the uh, MLR. It's quite an impressive effect. And one thing I'd like to point out with this is that you see he's being stimulated, he's walking straight, but he's able to control the direction of movement still, even though in animal literature, Often you'll see that when you stimulate, um, uh, it's, it's a go forward type of initiation of, of gait. And it's for straight ahead. And to be able to modulate the direction of movement is a, a key and an, an important feature of this method because you don't want to just go straight. You want to be able to turn and go where you, you, you know, direct, your, direct yourself. So, the MLR is a physiologically defined point, 
and there's a controversy with respect to what is the anatomical correlate. As I have said, there's evidence for at least two or three different air, uh, nuclei, the cuneiform, subcuneiform, and the peduncular pontine, and they're adjacent to each other. And the question is, what is the most efficacious target that we should be uh, uh, looking at for uh, during implantation? And um, the initial results from MLR, um, uh, deep brain stimulation, protocols were very, everybody was very enthusiastic. And I think that over the uh, um, course of a number of years now, the level of enthusiasm actually has re been reduced. And the reason is because they seem to be uh, okay types of results. They're not particularly startling. And one of the reasons may be is that the targeting is actually slightly off. And so here is examples of some of the um, uh, things that have, have come up uh, in the human literature, which suggests that uh, the target may actually not be the peduncular pontine, which is the standard target that's being used now, but rather slightly more dorsal in the midbrain in the cuneiform area. And one of the, one of the areas that... Um, um, ways of assessing this is to do recording of, of neuronal activity during the implant procedure. And here is the trajectory that's used in, in this study in one of the patients. And only when the, the, uh, the electrodes are within the subcuneiform uh, area were they getting uh, neuronal responses to, um, to gait, uh, uh, imaginary gait. And the responses did not occur in the peduncular pontine uh, area. A more recent uh, work done, um, uh, summary by Getz et al. in 2018 in neurosurgery, showed that the best responses actually for uh, alleviation of, of freezing of gait were not found when the, the stimulation electrodes were uh, within the peduncular pontine area but rather within the cuneiform nucleus. So that's suggested now that maybe the target isn't exactly correct, and maybe we should be targeting slightly differently um, uh, from that. <clears throat> so what does the animal literature tell us? Uh, since this is a controversy now, uh, and there's a lot of evidence which is indicating that the peduncular pontine nucleus is not should not be the target. Here, for example, is the elegant work by Takakusaki, uh, who showed, and there's an, quite a few papers, I've had to choose uh, one out of maybe from 10 uh, papers which indicated the same kind of data. When they did a stimulation uh, mapping in the cat, uh, in the cerebrate cats, uh, only when the, the, uh, nu the elect electrical stimulation was within the cuneiform nucleus were he uh, uh, and his colleagues able to initiate locomotor activity. Uh, they did not see that uh, when uh, stimulation was occurring within the peduncular pontine nucleus. Rather, in fact, they saw postural changes, some of which were uh, to, to uh, uh, have the animal basically sit down. So <clears throat> a more recent uh, optogenetics studies, there are now three or four, where they uh, can transduce um, channel rhodopsin into specific uh, cell populations within the midbrain, have shown that uh, optical stimulation of um, cholinergic neurons uh, from stop will not initiate locomotion at all. If the animal is already on the move and they stimulate the cholinergic neurons, what they found is there is a neuromodulation effect as there is a slight increase in the speed of the locomotor activity. In contrast, stimulation of glutamatergic neurons uh, initiates locomotion with an, a, fa a fantastic effect, which shows that uh, not only from uh, standstill, but also in freely moving animals, 
which shows the strength of the glutamatergic uh, uh, neurons and the, the, um, it, that it's actually the type of cell which is involved in the initiation. Uh, these ones were stimulated, uh, I believe, um, uh, at 50 hertz, uh, but there also is effects, effectiveness at 20 hertz and at lower frequencies. And you can see um, if we can have this uh, uh, movie here, please. Or maybe I can get it to go. So you'll see the application of the light. This is a stimulation of the glutamatergic neurons. Okay, cholinergic neurons define the pedunculal pontine nucleus, but the PPN also has glutamatergic neurons. So which is it? So let's take a look at the next slide. <clears throat> Investigation of the glutamatergic neurons in the different areas have revealed that the most effective sites for initiation of locomotion has been when the optogenetic stimulation is in, in fact uh, done within the cuneiform nucleus. So it indicates quite strong uh, evidence that this is the target that we should be looking at. Um, we've just recently published a, a couple of months ago a paper um, on the uh, activity-dependent labeling in, from the cat in the decerebrate cat preparation uh, during um, the animals that are induced to walk with MLR stimulation. I may put in a plug for um, this paper appears in our special issue, which is uh, to be published, I think, as an e-book. Uh, which is freely downloadable um, uh, from Frontier's website within, within two or three weeks. Here is a nice example of the locomotor response uh, and mapping in, in our uh, experiments, where we have our electrodes stimulating at different areas uh, across here from the cuneiform, subcuneiform, and into the PPN. And we see that the most effective uh, spots uh, for stimulation evoked locomotor ac activity <clears throat> occur um, here within the cuneiform nucleus. There's also a uh, an increase at the same time in the blood pressure as well as the heart rate, which is be typical uh, type of response. And here's a, a blow up of some of the activity that's produced by stimulation in that area. Uh, no, but there are further down in the brain stem within the medulla, and I'll show you uh, that some of the regions down there, which are involved in control of, of uh, uh, blood uh, pressure and heart rate, are actually uh, uh, turned on uh, by MLR stimulation. Here is um, the, uh, the uh, mapping of uh, FOSS. Uh, the CFOS proto-oncogene expression, which is an activity-dependent uh, 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 label, with MLR stimulation. And you can see that uh, here is the MLR, and you can see here the presence of a variety of different cells within the lateral reticular formation as well as in the medial reticular formation. You can see them here on blow-ups from two of those. And there's a, a much greater increase in the number of FOS-expressing cells in the locomotor group compared to the control non-locomotor group. And here are those things here. The number of cells here expressed uh, between in animals control and in locomotion uh, uh, groups here are indicated and they're significantly higher than that seen in the control animals. We also did uh, labeling uh, to, dis to determine the phenotype of the cells, and we are interested in the monoaminergic neurons as they are one of the, the strongest neuromodulator uh, neurons uh, within the brain. And we wanted to know if there uh, was evidence that these cells were also being um, uh, turned on by MLR stimulation. 
for a variety of reasons, one of them being that the uh, application of noradrenergic and serotonergic drugs to the spinal cord dramatically affects the and modulates the locomotor pattern and rhythm. So we would expect then that this would occur, a, an activation of these types of neurons. And that's what we found. Here was, is a map of all the different uh, neurons with MLR stimulation in a coronal view. <clears throat> and the, uh, here are some of the uh, uh, figures of uh, the cells expressing FOSS. And these ones here with dopamine beta hydroxylase, a marker for norad noradrenergic neurons. Here in the different nu noradrenergic nuclei, cholera fuse, locus, ceru locus ceruleus, and subceruleus, and uh, other types of cells that were not labeled for uh, DBH are also showing their expression here, compared to control, which much less. So the ones in orange and, and red are the DBH uh, neurons that are activated uh, in, with MLR stimulation. They're a small percentage of the po overall population of neurons activated. The ones here in, in uh, 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 just FOSS expression are these ones in, labeled in, in white, compared to control, which is nearly nothing. <clears throat> we looked at uh, cholinergic neuron uh, mapping as well. And uh, we found that cells here expressing uh, in blue are cholinergic with FOSS, and there are relatively few that show uh, uh, any kind of expression. Um, there are some also occurring in the lateral tegmental dorsal nucleus, uh, which is another cholinergic neuron, and it's about the same percentage of cells there which are expressing FOSS uh, in the locomotor. Um, group. Um, lastly, serotonergic neurons uh, here in, shown in yellow are also showing uh, FOSS expression. So we did another study where we looked at the release of monoamines during these uh, locomotor, uh, uh, prep in these locomotor preparations. And, uh, and this paper here was published in 2017. I also, here's another. <laughs> Another book which is now uh, published from another special issue that we did, uh, which is also freely downloadable. So the results from that, using a technique called fast cyclic voltometry, we were able to determine the extracellular concentration of monoamines um, during evoked locomotor activity. And we found that as when we mapped these concentrations in real time, we could see changes in serotonin here indicated in red or norepinephrine indicated in black uh, with uh, stimulation of the MLR in multiple areas of, of the uh, spinal cord. Uh, we, we didn't map in these particular ones. On this particular slide, we have some maps which show there is release also within the motor nuclei. Our overall conceptual model here has changed because of this uh, data. And uh, <clears throat> it is indicated here that the descending locomotor pathway isn't really just a singular uh, pathway like reticulospinal command, but it also is a, par is a parallel pathway. And it involves the activation of neuromodulatory systems to the spinal cord. And that makes it a, lot of, a lot of sense to um, to much of the animal literature uh, to date, which indicates the, strength, the strong neuromodulatory effects of these particular transmitters on locomotor activity. And here we do not actually have much uh, in respect to the role of the pedunculopontine nucleus uh, in the overall conceptual model. Oh. <clears throat> we found, um, I wonder if I have it here. Okay. We found that the, the dorsal respiratory and ventral respiratory group uh, uh, neurons showed an increased FOSS expression in the locomotor animals. We did not measure the uh, animal ventilation, uh, as these are uh, animals that are neuromuscularly pa paralyzed. 
and uh, they are artificially ventilated. And this could be very important in spinal cord injury, right? Right. Where you often don't have adequate respiratory drive. Right. So we think that it makes sense, actually, not only the respiratory drive, but also the cardio, uh, uh, cardiac output is actually uh, increased. So blood pressure, heart rate as well. And we, we found in the dorsal uh, motor nucleus of the vagus that where FOSS expression was up as well. So this is also a sort of ancillary kind of effect to MLR stimulation, which would be beneficial in spinal cord injury, of course. So <clears throat> we, uh, we see that that MLR stimulation can be useful in treatment of freezing of gait, and the question is whether it could be also useful in, in locomotor deficits that are observed in spinal, after spinal cord injury. And considering that 61% of the uh, um, uh, new injuries are actually incomplete, and, and there are retained fiber pathways between brain and spinal cord, then this is a possibility uh, at least for deep brain stimulation uh, uh, neuromodulation strategies as it requires some kind of physical connection between the two centers that you want to modulate. So we did a proof of concept study in, in the rat and we're now working on with Dr. Guest and his group in a translational study on the micropig. And this is uh, examples to show the, the differences in size of, of um, uh, the spinal cords in the rodent, in the pig, and in the human. And uh, we actually have need to be examining these effects in a large animal model uh, so that because we can actually, uh, it's a translational model, so that we can actually test human uh, uh, designed electrodes and so on and so forth. So in our initial study on, in the rat, which is indicated uh, here. In 2017, we published a paper and <clears throat> that uh, we tested the efficacy of MLR stimulation in a, in a mid-thoracic contusion injury, injured an, a rat model. And if we could just uh, turn on this uh, film here. So here is stimulation is on. We have implanted into the MLR. Stimulation on again. So it's rather, it's very effective. Okay, so, <clears throat> and then the third round of stimulation. And here uh, shows a nice uh, EMG output with MLR stimulation from the rat. In our model, we actually assessed um, um, in, in, during the acclimation period locomotor activity. We would do an MLR implant, uh, a spinal cord injury, and then testing at regular intervals with speed tests and endurance tests with and without stimulation. And our sites that we found that were effective were actually located in, in the cuneiform nucleus. Here is a, a slide of the uh, different levels of uh, severity of the injury. Uh, we did three, uh, the mild, uh, a moderate, and a severe injury. And we tabulated the, the percent preserved uh, uh, and versus damaged white matter in the different groups. Here is preserved and then damaged is indicated by the lighter color. And our BBB scale uh, scores for the three different groups, uh, showing a separation of, of the of motor effects. Um, so stimulation in, <coughs> um, in the rat, uh, early after injury, we were able to actually induce stepping, where the animal ha was incapable of, of stepping itself. Here shows, uh, if we could have this, uh, this movie here, please. You can see the effect. An animal on the treadmill has basically no weight support, and we had a, a, a halter here to, to hold it up 
Could we have this movie? Um, well, he gets that. Yeah, so here's the animal before stimulation. And we tried to uh, have sensory stimulation to induce the stepping movements, but we got really only very mild effects. And then MLR stimulation is on, and the animal begins to step. And you'll notice that immediately that it actually climbs out of the, the uh, hold, holster holder, and it shows uh, uh, weight support. And we were able to stimulate um, increase, increasing, uh, s uh, the animal is able to, to walk up to um, 22 meters per minute uh, in this first test uh, one week after injury. And you can see here from footfall patterns as well as the um, uh, uh, swing uh, uh, joint uh, position markers here on the hind limb and the forelimb, uh, the um, before stimulation and after stimulation where we have nice uh, uh, movements of the joint and complete stance and, and swing phases uh, during stimulation and re uh, footfall patterns as well. It is as long as you stimulate. And in fact, in animals, uh, you can also get a uh, after effect. So the animals will continue walking for a brief period of time. So here's the speed um, with, uh, uh, with respect to time relative to the injury, one week after to up to 12 weeks after injury. And this is the speed that's at attained by the animal by itself without stimulation. At two weeks here, after the, the first week of the spinal shock, the animal was able to do some walking on its own. It regained some of the, of the weight bearing. But you can see the uh, enormous difference with respect to speed. We were able to get up to 60 meters per minute on an animal with stimulation. So <clears throat> this is not a cure of paralysis per se. But it is, shows that, that you can overcome paralysis associated with spinal shock uh, early after injury. And our effects now are, are tabulated here on maximum speed of the, of the control group, the mild, moderate, and severe uh, mid-thoracic injured group without and with stimulation at the different time points. And you can see the, the highly significant effects of the um, uh, MLR stimulation for the speed of locomotion. And we also did a, a test uh, with a locomotor challenge, and we showed that the animals, the, the distance that they could uh, walk were increased significantly with MLR. So then <clears throat> we've taken this into the um, uh, Yucatan Micropig, which is a translational model of neurosurgery and spinal cord injury. And we have done this to settle some of the controversies uh, with respect to what is the target of stimulation, what kind of frequencies we should be using for, uh, with stimulation, um, and uh, with using Medtronic DBS electrodes so that they are uh, dimensionally compatible with the pig brain. So this is a nice way of looking at the effectiveness uh, in a translational model for for human uh, deep brain stimulation. And we used an MRI-guided uh, tech, um, uh, technique for implantation, and we <clears throat> then calculate our uh, uh, target of interest, region of interest, and place the electrodes, and then uh, we can then stimulate. Uh, here we can see this is possible because we have an atlas uh, that uh, is available, Felix, at all uh, of the porcine brain. And we also then do the immune, uh, histochemistry uh, of the uh, target areas to find out where our elec electrodes are located. So uh, we've developed a technique where we can actually stimulate during implantation by changing the type of anesthetic. So that, and this is very, it's rather complicated, but it, it is possible then to, to change the anesthetic level to, and then um, by titrating neuromuscular blockers, reduce the overall 
motor response so that the animal stays in the frame during stimulation. And we're able to then um, uh, place our electrodes uh, appropriately. Here is, for example, the effects of uh, stimulation of different sites here located by a, a contact zero to three. <clears throat> and uh, the effective sites are found in E1 and E2. Uh, here are the EMG responses that we record and our um, 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 processed data, which are the rectified and low-pass filtered data, which we can see uh, what we do for each of these uh, um, muscle uh, responses are overlaid on top. And so we can also then observe the effects on the actual movement of the hind limb. So we can place our electrodes relatively nicely during the implant procedure. We use limb electromyography to then test the animal. We have open field testing and we also do testing on, on the treadmill. And we stimulate and, uh, and then we can observe uh, in a, um, the, the treadmill, a manual treadmill allows the animal to actually generate the, the movement of the belt so that we don't have the animal responding only to a motor treadmill, which is in a fixed speed of the treadmill. This way we can actually in, uh, look at initiation and then appropriate speed uh, measures as well. And here's a nice example in a, an uninjured animal of the uh, response um, uh, at different frequencies of stimulation uh, that we get in, um, and these are the electromyogram uh, processed uh, data. And the animal here is actually walking uh, voluntarily. And then we stimulate at these different uh, uh, frequencies. And then we can measure uh, the different aspects about the, the, the uh, EMG responses. So here's, for example, during this period, the frequency of the stepping increased with 20, 30, 40, and 50. And you can see that the, the, the higher frequency stimulations give an increased frequency response of stepping. And the amplitude, the mean amplitude of each of these peaks and the burst area correspondingly increases as one increases frequency. And the duty cycle, which is a measure of the uh, amount of time during the, uh, the averaging uh, step uh, cycle that the burst is on, and does it express as a percentage uh, from zero to 100 percent. And <clears throat> in all cases that we see that we, that we measure on the muscle activity, the du duty cycle also increases. And then to a point where there is actually some overlap between extensor and flexor activity uh, during the high frequency stimulation, but it's a, a rather uh, modest amount. So that for antagonists, there is a certain amount of co-activation. After injury, a mild contusion injury, you may get a, uh, an, um, a recovery to some extent. Here <coughs> is an animal which shows pre-injury EMG responses uh, two weeks post-injury uh, and at three weeks post-injury. And this is an animal uh, with a mild contusion, it re uh, scores a um, Miami Project walking scale uh, number of seven, seven which is inconsistent consistent sequences of consecutive dorsal or plantar steps in overground testing. And uh, uh, on the treadmill, uh, we require that the, the animal receive, has partial weight support. But we still get an, uh, an, uh, uh, some activity in the hind limbs. And the correspondence between forelimb and hind limb uh, uh, is, does not necessarily, uh, is not necessarily good. So you can have different um, um, uh, frequencies, uh, two to one, two, two, two times the steps on, on the forelimbs with, compared to one, and so on and so forth. And those are uh, um, uh, observed in, in the animals that are injured. Early after injury, MLR deep brain stimulation will facilitate EMG um, uh, that increase the EMG activity and also uh, the forelimb, hind limb coupling uh, uh, early after injury. And <clears throat> this animal is a moderate contusion injury, so the, the uh, EMG responses are actually rather small, but you can see that there is an increase here 
in some of those responses and in average step cycles the uh, amplitude of those responses uh, in here in blue are much greater than that seen without stimulation. At the time of testing, the animal scored a four, which is alternating flexion extension movements of hind limbs, but without any weight support. So MLR deep brain stimulation will improve um, partial weight supported gait parameters in, in the animals. And here we can see 12 weeks post uh, uh, moderate S SCI and with a, an MPWS score of six. If we can have this slide uh, or this uh, movie on, please. You'll see the effect here of a stimulation without stim now and then with stimulation. The animal is nicely walking with its forelimbs and we get stepping here with the hind limbs. Okay, so um, MLR deep brain stimulation also we've seen improves partially weight bearing, weight supported gait parameters. And you can see that in this slide where we've actually have a trial. The frequency of the forelimbs is two hertz and the frequency of the hind limbs are two hertz during stimulation. But without stimulation, there's a two to one a coupling. <clears throat> Here we see the uh, position of the hip. The hip height is actually increased during MLR stimulation. The ankle angle of uh, uh, in expressed as a, deg a degrees uh, shows a nice excursion here uh, with stimulation and then uh, it, the excursion decreases uh, post stimulation. And then of course this increase in speed with stimulation. Now, early after injury, um, the problem is weight bearing. And this is, a, is going to be obviously an issue in humans because there's a lot of weight to bear. And if you want to have deep brain stimulation, improve gait, you need to have appropriate uh, uh, weight support of, of the person. So <clears throat> we found that um, uh, even at 12 weeks in severely injured animals, you do not have a uh, good weight support. So we've actually incorporated, uh, since MLR stimulation will improve weight uh, the weight support, it does not fix it in, in a heavy animal such as this. So what we've done is that we've, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Guest's group, we now <coughs> Uh, implant um, uh, epidural stimulating electrodes for electrical stimulation of the lumbar cord. And we can see that the, if we can run this uh, video, that uh, with stimulation, we can get um, a nice standing up of the hind limbs. So there's good extension of the hind limbs and nice weight support. When we've combined that with deep brain stimulation, here, what we've seen is nice forelimb locomotion, but early after injury, we get more or less just extension of the hind limbs. And it hasn't been um, uh, particularly good because you, you've increased the extension and you pull yourself along, which is not what you want. You want stepping to occur in the hind limbs as well. Uh, however, f uh, uh, later on, the uh, epidural stimulation uh, becomes um, uh, effective in initiating stepping-like movements in the, hind, uh, in the hind limbs with stimulation. And this is a slide uh, courtesy of Dr. Guess and his group showing the placement of the electrodes and then they measured joint angle ex and the excursions of uh, the hind limbs uh, before and during um, stimulation of uh, the lumbar cord. And you can see that they, they were able to initiate stepping quite nicely with uh, epidural stimulation. And in our hands, what we've done is we've done combination of this and later uh, uh, animals, uh, um, uh, out later after injury, <coughs> we do see uh, the effectiveness of combinations of deep brain stimulation and epidural stimulation. Here's can be seen here in this animal 
where we have different combinations, epidural stimulation, um, MLR deep brain stimulation, and combined stimulation. And the, these are the EMG responses. And then some bouts of spontaneous locomotion. And we take a look at the uh, EMG activity that we have uh, a good activity in, in at least in uh, many of the hind limb muscles in the combination. So when we take a look at the joint excursion, we have nice com um, effects on joint excursion um, and in combined stimulation as well, we get a, a, a good facilitation as well compared to the spontaneous locomotor activity. Uh, if you compare spontaneous locomotion, uh, the joint excursion of uh, the hind limbs uh, uh, and the forelimbs, you'll see that there is a, 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 disc, uh, a not a correspondence between forelimb and hind limb in the joint excursion and, um, during stepping, but they line up quite nicely uh, during MLR stimulation. And uh, we see these effects here on um, are significant uh, with uh, MLR and also in combined stimulation. Lastly, um, the, there is an interesting uh, uh, observation that we've made, and that is that complex stimulation programming may be necessary to optimize this deep brain stimulation. And this is illustrated in this animal where we found that um, when we stimulated in, um, in the subcuneiform and cuneiform region, we f observed locomotion and, and fear and freezing responses. If you stimulated in the uh, PPN, we got squatting, chewing, and vocalization. And if you stimulated beneath the PPN, you got circling behavior. But when you combine stimulation of, of the dorsal and the ventral, we got perfect rectilinear locomotion, which was actually quite startling uh, uh, compared to the, the single stimulation uh, points. And we wondered about this and um, how this would work. And it, there's a whole literature uh, which we <laughs> discovered that uh, here with uh, uh, orientation selective stimulation strategies. And uh, depending upon the orientation of the fibers that are uh, uh, around the stimulating electrodes, uh, one can actually selectively stimulate them depending upon whether they're parallel or they're perpendicular and so on by changing the, the uh, stimulation um, um, charging sphere uh, and by by using more than one electrode contact uh, together. And so what we, we, we are proposing to do is, is to create a finite element models of this MLR deep brain stimulation from structural and diffusion weighted MRI and CT images us, using this modeling software. And um, we've done some of this MRI uh, modeling here where we can see the orientation of the fibers in and around our electrode. And we've placed then the position of these, um, um, these different nuclei uh, on this particular MRI image to get us an idea about what orientation of the uh, fibers are with respect to the electrode as well as the position of the cuneiform and PPN. So we're continuing to try to improve that. So, in conclusion, I think descending locomotor drive can be augmented by stimulation of MLR. Targeting of MLR for freezing of gait should also include sites within the cuneiform nucleus to optimize the gait. Uh, MLR stimulation can improve weight support, induce stepping, de increase EMG output, increase speed and endurance, and improve interlimb coordination after spinal cord injury. And it may be uh, possible to um, increase uh, rehab in patients with SCI uh, if you combine it with other therapeutic strategies, such as uh, epidural stimulation to further enhance locomotor function. And our future directions here are uh, a pilot clinical trial where we're actually, uh, we have funding here in, in to target the cuneiform in levodopa 
resistant freezing of gait in patients with Parkinson's disease. And Jonathan Jagged is the PI, and here are the other uh, uh, co-investigators <coughs> here uh, from neurosurgery and neurology. And this is the design. Uh, we want us to study bilateral cuneiform nucleus DBS for freezing of gait. We have four Parkinson's patients with non-levodopa responsive FOG. Uh, we will do detailed accelerometer-assisted gait assessments at different times and look at the efficacy of cuneiform DBS. Um, and so this is uh, something which is now being initiated. Uh, we have funding and approval from FDA clearance, and we are now doing that. And this is my last slide, collaborators and funding. Um, in our lab, a number of people here, uh, and UM collaborators as well that are listed here. Jan Opris, James Guest, Johan Sol Solano, Andrea Santa Maria, Jorge Bojaquez, uh, for the wor work, more recent work. And in my lab, Francisco Sanchez, uh, Luz Villamil, and Stef Stefano Chang are uh, primarily involved in the pig work and uh, our previous collaborators and our funding. So thank you very much, and I can take questions. You are funded now by Morrison Scientific and Clinic Google? Yes. So we have uh, internal funding uh, from UM, as well as we have some funding from Boston Scientific. They will pay for electrodes and so on. Uh, I, we're mostly ready to go, yes. So we have, in fact, uh, one, one patient who's expressed interest, um, and, but we, we have to initiate that. So things are progressing. The whole idea is to actually use this as a test proof of principle the population with Parkinson's disease is much, much greater than that with spinal cord injury. And they have a different, you know, um, health, health uh, issues uh, compared to the SCI population. And we, we think that it's appropriate to test this in, in, in those patients. So we'll be targeting also uh, the PPN, but we will then try to assess appropriately uh, the cuneiform uh, targets as well. So we want to make sure that our trajectories include those partic that particular nucleus as well so that we can make a comparative effect. And so <clears throat> we at least ex expect to see some improvement and maybe even a, a, a greater improvement with uh, the DBS testing with cuneiform. Then it would eventually be taken into the SCI population. Anyway. Thank you.